Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, Episode 2 with Jared Spool. We are very glad to have you on, Jared. Your reputation does not require me to introduce you, but I will do my best. He is the founder of UIE, User Interface Engineering, writer, speaker, and author of all things user experience design and product. He is also part of building a new school to create more UX designers in the world, Center Center. Jared Spool, welcome. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. We are pleased to have you. And as I mentioned before, uh, been following you certainly my entire career. So it's very much an honor to have you on and talk about design. Oh, you're the one. I am the one. I've, I'm the one that's been following you. <laughs> oh, man. I've been wondering who that right. was. Glad to finally meet you. Likewise. <clears throat> so, you know, I'll just dive right in, Jared, and ask you, what is product strategy? What is product strategy? Well, I mean, it depends on the lens that you're going to look through it at, right? It means a lot of different things. Uh, product strategy on the lens of going to market is about understanding how your products get to market and are placed there, you know, whether it's through a distributor network or whether you're going to sell it online or, or something like that. Uh, product strategy can also mean how you decide what features go in and out of your product. Product strategy can also mean how you're going to execute the design and, and implementation of the product. There's not one meaning to the phrase product strategy. And I think that that's a really great point to make. So let's, let's hone in on the latter two that you mentioned. You talk about product strategy can be what features are going to be in or out of your product. Right. Product strategy can be what we might call design strategy in UX design circles and how we will design and execute those things. Let's let's talk about those latter two. Well, I mean, it's it's more than design strategy, right? Because it you know part of product strategy has to do with you know which resources you're going to pull from in order to get something built. Some of those research sources might not be directly design related. They could be, you know, engineering related or uh, marketing related. So it's, it's product strategy means lots of things. Certainly figuring out what features you want to have, uh, deciding whether your goal is to do what your competitors are always doing or, or thinking about making it be something that is presenting new innovation in the, in the marketplace those are those are definitely strategy related mm -hmm. pieces yeah L let's get even more specific i mean so at aurelius we are very much focused on solving the right problems right that's what we talk about all the time and i would say even as just designers in general regardless of how we think designers in general tend to be passionate about their designs because they think it's doing the right thing, right? Quote, unquote, the right thing. And I would argue that product strategy is really defining that. What are the right things to do? Yeah, I mean, that definition of product strategy is uh, figuring out what you want to do. I mean, there, there is no sort of single method for deciding what the right things are. It really depends on, on your overall business strategy and what you're trying to achieve. I mean, deciding what the right things are for Walmart are very different than, you know, what Tiffany's might do. You take your service or your product strategy in the direction that meets your business, the business outcomes that you're looking for. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I So I'll, I'll jump in there and just even more specific to that then. I mean, let's talk about how, what is that jumping off point and how do we do that well? Because I completely agree with you. It's a matter of saying a good product strategy should fulfill a larger business strategy. That's, that's what I hear you saying, I think, in so, in so many words, right? And so oh, absolutely, yeah. as people who make products and designers uh, are part of that, how do, we, how do we do that? I mean, how do we well, take- Well, have to know what the overall business strategy is, right? So- mm -hmm. Again, that very much depends on the on the individual business as to where that comes from. Different businesses come to their strategy differently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're they're marketing driven. Sometimes they're engineering driven. Sometimes they have these days. There's this notion of a of a product organization within the larger organization that's thinking about these things. Sometimes, you know, they're completely reactive and they're just responding to what competitors are doing or what the marketplace is is specifically asking for. Uh, in organizations that have regulation, these things come through regulatory control and law changes. So there's all sorts of things that, that dictate what 
what decisions you make and how an organization gets to that is is very much you know unique and bespoke to that organization there there's no there's no rule of thumb that says this is the way you do that mhm mhm yeah absolutely you know and even outside of one of the things i'm curious about and to hear your take on outside of these highly regulated industries that have to meet certain requirements uh, legally right outside of them what do we think <laughs> is the most useful thing for us to take as a product organization, as designers from the business to effectively help them meet that. To ask it a different way, you know, assuming that that business strategy is already formed, because assuming we're not part of making that, you know, that should be delivered to us or shared with us or communicated in some way. What's, what's the jumping off point for us? What should we focus on or what should we be looking for out of that to really drive how we build great products, how we make a great strategy and design? Well, I think that the, you know, what you need to do, you have to find out what the business strategy is, right? Mm -hmm. And then ideally, you start to look around the business strategy to figure out where the the customer's problems are. Mm -hmm. Given a, a particular strategy, if the strategy is, you know, we're going to get our software into, you know, thousands of businesses by the end of the year, what problems do those do our those potential customers have that our software could solve for them and how do we start con- start to connect that up so yeah i really like that example of just saying okay cuz this is this is a pretty common business type goal right where we say we want wider distribution or we want deeper market penetration or something like that and i have found that as product organization and design organization, what what we sometimes fall down on is translating into what that means for the work that we do. Yeah. I mean, a good organization understands how to translate that into who is going to act, right? Mm -hmm. At some point, you're now talking about behavior. Someone's purchasing the thing. Someone's going to be using the thing. The thing has to be convincing that it's going to solve some problem. Mm -hmm. So what is it that it does? What problems does it solve? You do the research to find out what the problems are, and then you work from there. Where a lot of organizations get trapped is that they make up the problem. They just imagine what it is. They sort of craft it out of whole cloth. They don't really know why it is that they're building what it is, and they've made this out of fiction, and they haven't validated the assumptions on, on that fiction. And as a result, they build something for fictional users. And guess what? It doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things about fictional users is that they don't purchase as well as real ones. You're absolutely right. I've found that they have way lower budgets than real users. They do. They do. Even the ones who you imagine have big budgets. For whatever reason, they don't buy. That's right. That's right. It's a shame. So (laughs) I'm really glad that you brought this point up, right? So there's a, it's kind of a, multifold problem we have here. So in some cases, the business strategy is either either fabricated or at best fluffed. Uh, or, and you kind of mentioned this in the tail end of that, it's a pretty sound one, but we haven't validated those assumptions. So how do we get around those? How, is it our job? Is it our job as people building the product strategy and even you know the design strategy to solve those problems? Uh, I'm not a big believer in deciding that some things are our job and some things are not our job. Who gets to decide what is whose job and what happens when something is not listed as someone's job? Does just not get done? Is that acceptable? So I, I'm, I am not of the school that we sit here and we think in terms of roles. If something needs to get done, someone steps up and does it. That's, that's the nature of being a leader is just seeing an opportunity and 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 jumping into it. Is it our job to do this? I don't know, but why not? If we have the skills to do it, why shouldn't we do it? If we have the skills to do it, the skills are simple. They're what we would consider user research skills. You go out, you take the assumptions and you go look for evidence that there's a need and a desire and a willingness and budget and all the things necessary to make this thing happen. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. I think it's completely valid. Let's think about, or I guess the question I want to ask then off of that is, you know, as we're doing that, how do we know 
where to start with the research. So maybe some of us are pretty versed in doing user research, right? But even what I heard you describe, again, is a, is a spectrum of scenarios. It could be we have some assumptions, we need to validate those. Or in a better case, we have a pretty clearly defined business strategy and we need to know how to execute that. How do you go about those things differently? Just because a business strategy is defined doesn't mean it's been validated. Mm -hmm. So if it's been validated, then there's evidence. So you go find the evidence. Mm -hmm. And if the organization doesn't have the evidence, then you have to go produce the evidence. This is what things like Lean UX or Design Sprints or other types of sort of discovery activities are about. They're, they're really about understanding the problem better and understanding who is affected by the problem and who isn't affected by it. Are the people who are affected by it, do they have access to whatever they need to get your product to solve the problem, whether it's money or access to the software or whatever it is? If you have uh, some thing that, that, you know, some application that, that helps a business be a better business, are the things that you think that need to be in that product, do they actually help somebody? Are they actually producing the types of outcomes that that user or customer wants? Mm -hmm. And if they are, you're in good shape. But, you know, there, there's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, there's no one way or, or a single starting point or anything like that. It's, it's, there, are, there are so many variables involved that you cannot really think of it as a methodology or a process. You have to think of it as a playbook you know, something that says, hey, in this situation, these are the plays that will get us results the best. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually, I'm really glad that you mentioned it in that way. As I've always described it is it's less about the process or approach or even the tools that you use. It's more of this, these set of principles or underpinnings to the work that we do. And we've already touched on it, right? It's defining and appropriately describing what it is we're trying to do as a company. Then the other half of that, as we just spoke of, is you know figuring out from the people we're supposed to be doing that for, our customers, our users, whatever you want to call them, what those real needs and behavior are and matching those two things up in some way. Yeah, I mean, Dan Brown, like, who's got a new book coming out on discovery processes, he likes to say that there's basically two halves. You're framing the problem and you're framing the solution. And what you're trying to do is is really get your head around what the scope of the problem is and, and what it's about. And then start to look at the solution alternatives and figure out which of those solution alternatives are going to get you the best results. And so you have this sort of two-phase part of the discovery process. Uh, and a lot of people jump straight to the solution, skipping the framing of the problem, and end up putting out something that only meets the problem partially, mm. and then wonder why they struggle to, to get the results they're looking for. Yeah, that's a brilliant way of thinking of it in terms of there's this first piece, framing the problem, and then framing solution alternatives. The pitfalls you mentioned, again, are focusing on those solutions before we have a clear picture of the problems or maybe even right. all the way up to the business strategy. Right. There's an old saying that great designers don't fall in love with their solution. Great designers fall in love with the problem. So learning how to fall in love with the problem and sort of focusing on it that way mm -hmm. gets you to a much bigger picture of what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to believe a lot of people listening to this are saying, yeah, that's great, but I'm going to go into work tomorrow or I've already been in this situation where, you know, the project I get assigned to is make this feature for the mobile app, right? That's what, that's what gets handed to a lot of people. So how do we, how do we mitigate that? How do we prevent it from happening? Well, I mean, now you're talking about cultural issues, right? This is, this has less to do with design and more to do with the organization's culture. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for that individual to step up and say, I don't understand the problem yet. I need to go spend a couple weeks researching it. By the way, I don't think anybody else here needs understands the problem yet. So I think most of us need to go spend a couple weeks researching it. Let's all go do that. Mm -hmm. And if you're an organization where you're open to that and, and that's a possibility, you can get a lot more progress from this than if, if you're in an organization where it's like, no, you're being paid to sit at your desk and put out wireframes, put out wireframes, uh, at which point you have to ask yourself, 
why am I in a job where that's what I'm expected to do? Uh, particularly when there are lots of companies right now that are looking for designers who want to actually understand the problem and solve for that. Uh, part of it's an education of, of the people around you. One of the things that's gotten the design profession into trouble, I think, in recent years is that we've been very arrogant about our capabilities to solve problems and not inclusive and not being part of this. Uh, Dana Chisnell likes to use the phrase, with not for, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We don't design for our development teams. We don't design for our product teams. We, we design with them. And there's a good chance that if the designer doesn't know the problem well, the product manager doesn't know the product well, the developers don't know the product well, and they're all struggling with that if they don't understand the problem that it's trying to solve. Getting everybody to participate in problem understanding mm -hmm. is, is really quite key. But if the culture is not interested in that, for whatever reason, can't stop people from sticking beans up their nose. <laughs> I hear I, there was a, there was a talk I heard about that once. It wasn't too bad about beans up the nose. It's from this guy I heard of before. <laughs> so there are yeah. so many follow up questions I want to to ask you and to discuss onto this. I think the most well, let's relevant. Pick one. I'm sorry. Let's just pick one. Yeah, we'll just pick one. I think the most relevant one, to be honest with you, is okay. Great. Um, we have a choice here, right? If it's an organization that is not willing to look into that or pursue that line of thinking, I've given the same advice you have to uh, many people who've, who've asked me the question. I think it's time you find a new job. However, what about the situation when we are very much behind this company's mission and we want to help or they're open to this, but maybe we don't know how to get everybody on board and understanding what that problem is. So they're open to, maybe this is our first case. Yep, go off, take a few reach, uh, or weeks and research the problem and, and let's understand what that means more. But if this is your first foray into that, that can be harder to accomplish. So what advice do you have somebody in that situation? Well, you, you have to have air cover, right? I mean, you have to have some sort of management support, executive support. Doing good design is expensive. It's slower. It takes more resources. It doesn't produce results as fast, but it produces a better quality result at the end of the day. You have, you have to have the support that you're going to take the time to produce the better quality result versus just rushing to produce any result. If you don't have that support, there's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. But sometimes finding that support doesn't happen in the obvious places. Uh, you can't get that support by just convincing people that design's important. That never works. At least I've never been able to make it work. I gave up years ago. <laughs> but uh, what you can do is find somebody who's feeling pain. In an organization, almost always, what happens is, is if someone's working on user experience, chances are that they've been asked to do that because the organization feels that, that the experience is not as good as it could be. If they don't feel that, then why do they have somebody working on it, right? So, so you sort of have to start there. And if that's the case, if it's not as good as it could be, it usually means that, that the product or service is, is frustrating customers or users or internal employees or somebody. Whoever it is, somebody is being frustrated. Mm -hmm. And almost always, whenever there's frustration... That frustration shows itself on the bottom line of the business. Maybe sales are being missed. Maybe uh, support calls are coming in and costing the support center money. Uh, maybe developers are spending time rewriting things until the customer likes it, going through many, iterate, many more iterations than they probably should have because they're playing a game that we call Bring Me a Rock. You know, I want a rock. Okay, here's a rock. No, it's not blue enough. Get me another rock. Okay, here's another one. Oh, it's not big enough, right? You know, you just play that game forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, or uh, maybe the developers are creating features that nobody's using, which is a complete waste of expense mm -hmm. and making the product more complicated without adding any value because no one's using the new features. One of those things or more of those one or more of those things is costing money to the bottom line. So you can find those things and you can figure out how much they're costing the business. And 
almost always, in my experience, when you find something that's costing the business a lot of money, what you see is that the organization already has somebody who's assigned to fixing that problem. There's probably already somebody assigned to increasing the amount of sales. There's probably somebody already assigned to reducing the cost of support. There's probably somebody already assigned to making the development team more efficient. That person may not realize that one way to do that is to focus on the user experience problems. Right. But if you went to them and you said, you know, I could actually help you achieve your goal because I think I know where the source, one of the sources of it. And if you were to help me do some research, we could figure out if this is in fact the case. You suddenly have a typically senior person who has a lot of power in the organization because they've been tasked with solving this big problem mm -hmm. uh, to, to get behind what you're doing and say, yes, we want you to come do that. Sure, sure. You know, it's funny too, because you mentioned this whole bring me a rock game that sometimes we play as software technology organizations where we just, we develop things that we can do, but that doesn't mean we should do. And the reason I bring this up is it touches directly on what we were, how we kind of started into this, which is how do we know we're doing the right things in that case? Because what you just described is going to that person who may be responsible for some larger problem that they don't know design or a clear product strategy can actually address or even fix. How do we help them understand what the right problems to solve are in that case? Well, you have to, it's all about framing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to frame it in terms of what they're dealing with. So if their job is to reduce support costs, you start by framing the support costs. How much money is being spent on dealing with things that if we fix the product, the calls wouldn't come in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, your initial research is all about, well, what types of calls are coming in? How often do they come in? You can calculate the cost of support. It's actually really easy to do. You take uh, how much the company spends on having a call center or whatever their support mechanism is every year, and you divide it by the number of customers or calls that they help. That simple equation tells you the dollar cost per call. And then you say, okay, how many of these calls dealt with this problem? Multiply that by the dollar cost per call. I now have a budget number. Yep. You know, you can go to somebody and say, hey, if we fix this problem so that people didn't call anymore, that would save you N thousand or hundred thousand or million dollars a year, whatever it right. is. Right. No, that's great. And I mean, tying the work that we do, which can ob obviously be very subjective to the much more concrete, objective numbers is great. It's only subjective if you're not doing research. Sure. And actually, I I'm, I'm glad that you say that. Uh, to touch on that point, right? So there becomes this clearer picture and, in, in, you know, again, maybe even a clearer strategy, product or design strategy to get there. But we are eventually going to make recommendations in this case on here's the thing we should do or the thing we should design. Why? Or the feature we should make. Exactly. And so somebody's going to ask us why or there's going to no, be argument. I'm asking you why you think we're the ones to make the recommendations. I would say, you know, as the product organization people would be looking, I would expect people be looking to us to say, here's the thing that we should make, or here's the thing that we should do or fix in the product. Yeah, I think that's a horrible idea. Explain. I, I think it's much better if we get them to tell us what the recommendation is. Okay. Right? So if we go out and we say, hey, our organization is spending $2 million a year on answering a support calls about this particular question, they should be the ones who say, well, why don't we just fix that in the software? Mm-hmm. Because if they said that, we could go, you know, that's a good idea. I think I know how to do that. Let me show you some ideas I've been working up, right? I mean, suddenly they're involved. If I have to sell them mm -hmm. on this, if they're not convinced we should fix the problem, it's a much harder conversation. Mm. So I think we give up too early and we start in with the pitch. We figured out that it's $2 million, so we have a proposal. And I think we need to get them to come to the decision that it needs to be fixed. You know, you don't get a smoker to stop smoking by uh, constantly telling them how bad it is for their health. And I have yet to meet a smoker 
who doesn't know that smoking is bad for their health. Mm -hmm. The only way you get a smoker to stop smoking is they have to decide they're ready. The same is true for getting people to adopt better designs. You can't force their hand. They have to come to that conclusion. You just have to surround them with the information that makes it really hard for them to defend the position that not fixing it is the right path. That is a very refreshing and interesting perspective. So my follow on to that will be, how can we do that? What information and in what ways can we surround people with to ensure that they're in this, co well, this cocoon know, of good design <laughs> so they cannot hold an alternate position? It, it comes back to exposure. Almost always in organizations, the people who need to make the decisions are not being exposed to the customers having the problems, mm. particularly in larger organizations where we've done amazing work to isolate people from the users of the product. You know, it's it's really funny. You start with you start as a startup and the senior team is going out and they meet their first customer and they get to know their first customer and maybe they they're exchanging emails with all the first 10 customers and they they they're they're going into meetups and other things to pitch their thing and they're talking directly to the customers and there's this period in startups where the people who are creating the thing are meeting their customers firsthand and they they really get to see those people. And then they're really successful and they come this bigger and bigger company and you put layers and layers and layers of people in between and layers of systems. And, you know, let's say you only do online support. So now you don't even have anybody talking to customers. You don't have anybody meeting with customers. There's everything is, is layered. And the people who are inevitably deciding what the overall strategy of the business is. Have, are completely insulated from people who actually use the product, with the exception of maybe really large customers who are not representative of the bulk of people who use the product on day to day. And then we wonder why they make weird decisions, right? Yeah. The way to fix this is to break down the isolation, to expose everybody in the organization. And the best organizations are putting into place exposure policies that basically say that everybody has to be exposed to real people using the product or service for some minimum amount of time. The recommended minimum that we have is at least two hours every six weeks. Mm -hmm. That means that anybody who's going to influence the product, a product manager, a developer, a designer, uh, the lawyers who are coming up with the end user license and compliance disclosures, the executive that's going to come in with some sort of seagull maneuver and do that executive swoop and poop thing where they swoop into the project, poop all over the idea, and then swoop out. All of those people uh, need to be exposed to real users doing real work. Because if they're not, then they're just, again, working on fiction or, or the game of telephone. Right? The game of telephone is, is a miserable HBO series. <laughs> it, it, it is not the way that you should be thinking about the most important thing, which is, are you meeting the needs of the people who want to give you money? Mm -hmm. The key here is we need to be in a position where we are getting them exposed to our users. So the, the place you start is by increasing the exposure, showing them what's happening when people are using the product and doing it in a place that gets them to get more attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So bringing them out on customer visits, having them participate in usability tests, having them sit in on customer support calls. Those are the things that are most important. Again, now you get into culture. Now you get into role power. How are you going to make an executive do that? Well, you can't make an executive do that if they have higher role power than you, unless you tell them that this is the way they're going to solve the thing that's their top priority. So you have to know what their priorities are. And you have to know what it is they're trying to do. And if you say to them, I think I have a way to help you, they'll give you a lot of attention. Right. If you say, actually, I'm going to distract you from your priority and tell you that this design thing is more important than that thing you're working on, you're not going to get their attention. Right. Right. So what I hear you saying there, too, is really back to a statement I made earlier that I often tell people is and under demonstrating that you have a clear understanding what we're trying to do as an organization, and maybe in this case, specifically important to this stakeholder, to be able to draw that parallel and say, if we do these things, it is directly helping us impact that thing we know is important to our organization. Yeah. 
I mean, you have to understand what the priorities are, and then you have to map what you're talking about into those priorities. Otherwise, you're fighting the priorities. You're trying to hop upstream. Right. And that's, you know, in any decent-sized organization, that's that's a pretty impossible task. Sure, I agree. So, So if you can talk their priorities, then you're good. Right. And this is the whole thing. Right. I, I I have this essay that I wrote a few years ago called, you know, why I can't convince your executives to think user experience is important. You know, people keep asking me, can you just come in and give an inspiring talk to get our execs to believe that user experience is important? And the answer is no, I can't. There's no way I can do that. I can come in and talk about their priorities. And then we can come up with a plan to figure out how we're going to solve their priorities. Mm -hmm. But at no time in that conversation am I going to mention that user experience is important. Chances are their priorities are partially, if not wholly, affected by the user experience of the product. That They don't care about that. They only care about the priorities. Right. So let's figure out the priorities. Right. So this is a perfect place for me to ask you then. You mentioned mapping that back and uh, you know maybe in your experience building that story couple things to mention there that requires the right information and the right format how do we go about that well it's communication right and so you know the right information has to do with you doing your homework Mm -hmm. the format has to do with what the organization needs right it's communication different people need different things you can't assume that one person that everybody takes information in the same way so you have to pay attention to what works best for that. Some people, you know, are happy with a PowerPoint deck. Other people need live demonstrations. Other people need to just hear the words and then go think about it for a while. Other people will react immediately. You, you have to tailor to, to the people. Mm-hmm. You have to do your homework. Sure. And when we think about that, I mean, regardless if it's a PowerPoint or, you know, a live demonstration or whatever, what have you found to be critical pieces of information about each side of the fence there? The critical piece of information is the thing that gets the, the – there is no one thing. The, the, the critical piece of information is the thing that, that makes the light bulb go off. Yep. And that's so contextually dependent that you can't say, well, always do this. It works 89% of the time. <laughs> you know, it, that's, that's a foolish approach to, to human-to-human communication. You know, for some folks – you have to feed them the information in little bits and mm. they have to believe that they came up with it on their own. And so I've seen a lot of people who just keep using the same messaging over and over and over again until they hear the executives start to repeat their messaging in, in group m- meetings. Mm-hmm. And they let the executive sort of claim it as if they had this idea themselves and they just go with that. In other cases, you have to you have to show everything in a spreadsheet, right? Yep. You're you're going to have to show that that the business is is going to be f- fiscally better off with co- a- course of action A over course of action B, and you better have a lot of evidence to show that 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 you can meet that promise. Uh, you know, it's really going to depend on who you're talking to and what the situation is and what their power in the situation is and what your power in the situation is and what sort of air cover you've got. There is no one thing. Right. So we talked a lot about how we, how we figure out what the right things to do, the right problems to solve are. I would say we covered at pretty good length. I mean, how we convince and work with upwards, you know, senior management, executive level, whatever that might be in our company to either learn what that is or work with them to define that. Taking a slight left turn, is design strategy different than product strategy? Well, is design different than product? I would ask you. Well, I'm not sure that's a meaningful distinction. Okay. Right? What part of the product isn't designed? I mean, you know, you can argue that, well, there's a whole engineering part to it. There's a whole sort of market reach analysis thing to it. But those, you know, if you treat design as the rendering of intent, all of those things are in our design, right? We have a particular market we want to reach. That's our intention. How we come up with a strategy to reach that market, that's 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 the design of the market mm-hmm. uh, plan. We have an engineering intent, how we create an architecture to support that intent. That's that's the engineering design. So all of those things are designed. And and you know, 
these days, it's getting harder and harder to say there are parts of the product that are not the user experience, right? When you're watching uh, some sort of streaming video, let's say you are watching Game of Telephones uh, on <laughs> HBO, there's a group of people in, in the HBO organization whose job it is to make sure that the bits come off the server as fast as possible, right? They're, they're in charge of latency and bandwidth and all the things that have to do with, with the performance and network throughput of the HBO servers. And conventionally, we would say, well, those are engineers. They don't have very much to do with user experience. What they deal with is, is not user experience at all. But you're sitting there watching your television show. You're watching Game of Telephone. And suddenly that little spinner thing shows up in the middle of the screen and the, and the scene freezes. Suddenly the, the message is lost. And, and all you see is that spinning buffering symbol. At that moment, the user experience is, is wrecked. And at that moment, the people who can fix the user experience are those engineers. So suddenly they are in charge of the user experience. And until they fix that problem, the user experience will suck. So what parts of the design or the product are not part of the design, right? And so I don't think there's a difference between a design strategy and a product strategy. I love it. I love it. For what it's worth, I completely agree. And this brings us back to this larger conversation of what is product strategy and how do we make a good product strategy? I would argue that the dis- every decision we make Every decision we make should be, as you would put it, one made with intent, one made from a place that demonstrates a very clear understanding what we're trying to do as a business, because let's face it, we have to make money or we have to meet certain goals as a, as a business. But just as importantly, and perhaps more importantly, what it's doing for the experience of that product for the people we're trying to serve. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. You know. You've got customers, you've got users. At some level, if you don't make them happy, they'll go someplace else. What are you doing about that? Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, the way that I've always thought of it is, you know, their happiness is, it's like a cup, right? And it's, it's, it's a certain, the, the cup is full to a certain degree. And then there's the business cup and that cup is full to a certain degree. And you can pour those together, but it might overflow. The important thing is to, Get the right balance, right, between the cups so that when you, when you pour them together, it doesn't overflow and you don't have any havoc and you don't have to lose anything on the business side or the customer side. You know, I, I have a friend, um, and I'm sure that you know him, Fred Beecher. He's mentioned before, uh, outwardly that the dirty little secret of user experience design is it's not all about the user. It's doing something that's also meaningful as your organization or your company, right? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, if it doesn't help the organization succeed, then inevitably it will hurt the organization. You know, it, it's a you're either helping the organization move forward or you're holding the organization back. You need to understand what the organization's trying to do and the direction it's trying to go. Absolutely. Well, Jared, this has been as always a compelling discussion with you and insightful one. I know that you guys at UIE have some things coming up. Anything you want to share before we wrap up today? Uh, sure. We have our UI21 conference, which is going to be in Boston at the end of October, beginning of November, October 31st to November 2nd, which will be a three-day event. We've got Dan Brown talking about discovery. We've got Melissa Perry talking about MVPs, which is another technique for for doing discovery type work. Jeff Patton talking about story mapping, and there's a whole bunch of other folks speaking at this. So I would check that out. Uh, you can learn more about that at uh, uiconf uiconf dot com. And uh, we're starting Center Center, which we our first class starts on October seventeenth. We we're going to start a second class in the spring. That's our school for industry-ready UX designers. So if you know people who are thinking about a career change and want to get into UX, that's a, uh, a good way to do that. And we are going to be running our UX strategy playbook where we talk about this, the stuff that we've talked about here and a lot of the other big plays that have to do with growing your UX maturity in your organization. Uh, we're going to do that in Canada 
in uh the in the winter because you know Canada in the winter is awesome. Uh, so Toronto in December and uh, Vancouver in November. So we'll get both rain and snow. And uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to that. And you can find out about that at uxstrategyplaybook.com. So there you go. Fantastic. Sounds like all great events that will help people figure out how to build that clear product strategy, figure out ways in which to solve the right problems. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so as well. So go to go and check those out. I'm sure they will be fantastic events as always. Uh, Jared and his team puts on. Jared Spool, thank you so much for joining us in the discussion today. And thanks for listening. Well, th- thank you for encouraging my behavior. Thanks for listening to Aurelius Podcast talking about product strategy and design strategy. We are the first platform of its kind to help you solve the right problems for your customers and your business and build products and services that truly matter. You can check us out at AureliusLab.com. That is www.A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. You can check us out on Twitter at AureliusLab and Instagram AureliusLab. We'll see you next time.